forward, you've had courses with me, and we do a web page. In case I was responsible for it. And the videos will be made in each lecture by Kezai. And I will uh, write annotation to each video. Uh, so you can uh, think about I will write a little summary of each one that will be available. And uh, I'm not yet sure how we will work on homework or exams. My concept is that we are a small group, and if you have questions, you can ask me. And if I have questions, I can ask you. We can relax, and no exams, no homework, no nothing. But I think we will have some some formal structure. Uh, we heard yesterday in the new system that we were talking about, call it the new system at Yakov's. There will be no midterms and no homework, also. Yeah. But there will be final exam only. Everything will be based on final exam, right? Yeah, Who's speaking? What? Yeah. You don't apply to You guys don't apply to this. Yeah. But my idea is no final exam, so this is based on nothing. <laughs> 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 okay, so thank you for coming. Uh, we saw this morning there were other some high school students here, and as a result, I gave a certain type of lecture that I normally make my But I do think I gave some good small introductory remarks on Riemannian geometry. By the way, I will lecture today for less time than usual, and then we will discuss how we will place the lectures in your schedule and my schedule. You know, that was, that's one of the big problems, but we'll solve it. And I heard today you have five lectures on Friday, is that right? Yeah. I, I mean, that's ridiculous. That's, you just can't. And this is the last one, so I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? Uh -huh. It's not the last one? It's also the first one. Ah, uh, the first one, we're a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's start again, very relaxed style. As you know, I like to start again. So with differential geometry. We underline the word differential because the invariants that we are going to be discussing are related to differentiation. <clears throat> and our beginning point is a manifold at M when I write this, and this will be an n-dimensional differentiable manifold. C infinity manifold, so smooth manifold. <clears throat> now I know uh, most, if not many, if not almost all of you, I have some experience with manifold, but uh, it's not required. Um, just keep in mind at the beginning. this manifold which might have much interesting topology or geometry in the classical sense. And we will always be uh, discussing in the neighborhood of some point which I will usually call x0. So the picture will be something like this. And as I said this morning, the manifold is created out of local pieces which are mapped by these charts which are called coordinate charts two pieces in Rn. I tried to draw this as the plane, but it's not the plane, it's, it's into Rn. So these local, we have, this is a point, x0 is a point, and uh, we identify with this coordinate chart the neighborhood, so u, and maybe x0 goes to a point over here, and I even call it x0 here in the plane, uh, U will be just an open set in the plane. In the plane. And this will be the identification, the local charts, as I discussed this morning, just like an atlas or Google Maps. And these will be smooth. 
So C infinity, the change of coordinates will be C infinity. <coughs> and at least for now, the coordinates here, uh, here I will have coordinates x, uh, which is x1 through xn. Coordinates. So we'll call these coordinates. And I want to remind you what is a coordinate. So, I mean, so what is a coordinate? So Rn is a vector space. And uh, in our case, we're thinking of this vector space over the real numbers. And so the field of definition here is this is real geometry in this case, over real numbers. <clears throat> and uh, for, for example, it has a basis, maybe not the standard basis, uh, let's call it standard basis, say, uh, and I, write, I like to write it like this in brackets, E1 through EN, standard basis. So I'm sure you know, but let me just write this as column vectors as in the usual way. So we have the usual column vectors as basis. And, and then if we have some element in this uh, vector space, so this is a vector space, maybe I'll call this the vector space V, I, which I identify with R and V of this basis. So V is in, the, in this vector space, V, then I identify it with Rn by the coordinates, and that just means I write it as x1 of v, e1 plus xn of v, e1. So this is the first step in elementary algebra. And uh, uh, it is necessary for this subject. I'd like to comment that in the time of Riemann, and even in the time of Christoffel, at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, linear algebra didn't really exist. The first book of linear algebra was written in Germany by a professor in Hamburg in 1928. It's interesting. It is somehow a new subject from the point of view of doing it systematically, but was done in some sort of ad hoc fashion. Uh, by people like Christoph and so on. So that's the situation, those are the coordinates. <clears throat> and we say that F is smooth on uh, U, and we talk about F is smooth in the neighborhood of this point. of x0 uh, whenever uh, f is the mapping from uh, u to the real number, say, uh, or to a, another vector space, w maybe, a vector space, but say to the real numbers, it's a real value function, f is smooth, uh, whenever uh, f of x1 through xn is smooth. <clears throat> and I think you all know multivariable calculus, what it means that a function of several variables is smooth. It's differential. Okay. I'll remind you it means in its local normal form, it is at the origin, let us say, if f of 0 is 0, so the function is equal to f of 0 plus a linear term, which varies with the point, which is called the differential of the function, and then a higher order term, which is the error between the linear part and the value of the function. Just so you know, f is equal to f of 0 plus 
a linear term, which is called the differential of f of 0 times x. So this is this function here. This is a linear function. This is a translation. This is an affine map. And this affine function approximates this function to lower order 2. Oh, excuse me, uh, lower order 1. So lower order 1 means that if you divide this by norm of x, it goes to 0 as x goes to 0. So we're discussing functions of that type. That's differentiable, but of course, <laughs> I wrote infinity here. And you should be critical, of course. That only means here c. That only means c differentiable. And if I write c one, it means one time continuously di differentiable. Okay. So c k means k times continuously differentiable. When I say C infinity, then I mean arbitrarily differentiable. And I, right now, I am not worried too much about degrees of differentiability. Let me say the difference between C1 and C0 is like the difference between, I don't know, nanotechnology and a hydrogen bomb. It's very big, this difference between C0 functions and C1. C2, C1, not so big. It's a qualitative thing you have to feel if you have experience in the time. So we know what is now a smooth function, a smooth map. So f from u to r, say some big R m, we write as a function is smooth, uh, means that all of the functions are smooth. I don't worry about differentiation. And this notion is independent of the chart because the change of variables is C infinity. But in my, if you have another chart, the change of variables is C infinity. So if I say smooth in one chart or smooth in another chart, it doesn't matter. Okay? Okay. And now what we do in mathematics is we have a point. So we've had this point x0. X0, that's a point in the manifold. We have X0 followed by U, that's, an, uh, that's local, near the point. And we have the full manifold, maybe with some non-trivial topology or something, who knows, God only knows, the point and the neighborhood, and this is the global situation. So in geometry, we talk about a point, local near the point, and global. So the first concepts are local. <clears throat> first concepts, it is sufficient to discuss them locally. say it anymore uh, for another two or three lectures. Uh, I'm just only going to worry about local discussion at first. You know, if you've done a little bit of algebraic geometry, this means you look at the local ring. Um, uh, you look at real analytic functions, this means you look at power series development. Um, um, so somebody did. So, um, hello? And these things are local, and it is very non-trivial nevertheless. So we should have always a, an example at hand, 
I, will, I, I drew a picture of the sphere or this morning, but I think I always forget the, the, the first slightly non-trivial example, which you have to think about seriously. This is R2, and you have the circle, let's say the circle of the radius 1 uh, is the manifold, which is the sphere of radius 1. That does not denote the radius, that denotes the dimension of the sphere. If I write S upper N, I mean the N sphere, okay? The sphere of, uh, of dimension N. The sphere of dimension N is the unit sphere in the standard norm in Rn plus 1. So let's look at the one sphere, <laughs> the one dimensional sphere. And uh, I hope we have a little color. Well, I guess we don't. Oh, a little bit of color is here. Today it's a green movement against climate change. So we will have green here for a, neighbor, a local neighborhood of, uh, of a point. And quite often in these situations where the manifold is embedded, in this case it's embedded in R2, we, the coordinates are determined by a projection onto something. Quite often the case. You can project naturally onto something. And here the coordinate is determined by projection. Right. So in some ways it's the most stupid thing. If you take a point x, y here, the coordinate mapping is x. Right? The inverse mapping is slightly non-trivial, as you know. It's something like the square root of 1 minus uh, x squared, right? So this mapping, let's just emphasize the inverse mapping quite often. You want to take the mapping, you understand something in coordinates, and then you want to go back in the manifold. This might be the, this might be the mapping phi on the coordinate chart here. This mapping phi inverse uh, maybe is the relevant thing for you to understand. And this inverse mapping here, is slightly non-trivial. I guess if, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's x in the usual coordinate goes to square root of 1 minus x squared. Right? Isn't that y? It's x squared plus y squared equals 1, so y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. Yeah, we, that's the first step we got. We got. Right? So it's slightly non-trivial. Interesting thing. As you know, you start integrating things of this type, the ratios of these things, you get into difficult elliptic integrals. So this is, this is something of interest. Okay, that is the, the chart. Um, mood. Good. So, so the first thing we study is in this manifolds are curves. I talked about this uh, curves in the manifold. And these are maps. So a curve is not a set. Please, please, if I ask you, uh, I, I wrote on the same thing, we would have oral finals. Maybe we will. I don't know what we're going to do. But uh, if I ask you on an oral final, what is a curve? And you say, well, it's some, you draw me a picture and say it's a set. I will get very mad because a set, it's, a curve is not a set, a curve is a map. You should try to write everything in life as a map, really. You should try to write everything you can do as a map. Writing it only as a set is normally not relevant. So I will usually let the interval be a 0, 1, but some interval, uh, which is closed, and it will be a smooth map. into M, and when that's a closed interval, for example, 0, 1, I mean by that smooth in the neighborhood of the, of the closed interval, right? That it, somehow smooth, C infinity in the, at, a, at a boundary point of an interval is some sort of crazy thing, right? But I mean smooth in the neighborhood of the interval, okay? So, i.e., smooth. in some <clears throat> neighborhood. Uh, 
Rien de plus. Ok. Now you know. All of this, you say, well, this is Mickey Mouse mathematics. It's just a little bit of advanced calculus, you know, analysis two, not even that. It's probably analysis one and a half and 1.356, right? And then I say to you, all right, that's fine. But that means what we should look at is the morphisms, which are smooth, from the interval to M. When I write hom, I mean, when I write hom, I, we use this loosely in, math, loosely in mathematics, I mean just the mappings. Uh, not homo, a curve is not a, a group or something, I mean, right? Not necessarily. For me, quite often it's a group. But, I mean, it just means the maps. Uh, let me clarify this. Let's not, let's not, that's too dangerous, this notation. Let's just write it, let's write a map. Some people write it at home. I, I, I want to write it back. It's the C infinity match. That is a horrible space. Given a manifold, the first space you look at is horrible. Right? The space of C infinity maps of any, any C infinity map into the thing. But the entire subject of differential geometry is somehow at the beginning based on this space. Because we're interested in connecting two points. We're interested in connecting by something of minimal distance. We're connecting by special curves. We're interested in taking smooth curves and going around and see what happens, etc., etc., etc. So we are really dealing with this, with this space, elements of this space. Okay. So here locally, and that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about just local curves in some neighborhood. So we have some neighborhood of some point, U, and we talk about local curves starting at, the, at maybe a base point we have. We talk about local curves maybe with self-intersections to a point from an interval. I quite often like to write the interval like that and with an orientation, and this is the map gamma, and to indicate that I have a certain orientation going from one point to another. X zero comes from uh, is gamma of zero, and X one is gamma of that of one and so on. One. Now the first thing that you learned about in elementary physics, somebody, she's, I know your name is Crystal, maybe? Yeah. She's in physics, what semester are you in physics? Fourth, very good, nice semester. So you know these guys in math and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you always write a picture of a curve and you talk about in physics, which uh, I love physics when I started in physics uh, because I thought it was very interesting, but then they ruined it for me because they wrote down all sorts of nonsense and I couldn't understand. Uh, and now I go back to it working with serious physicists. So I was very lucky, you know, the, you know just, it's just terrible, it's just at the beginning, they talk of work, work along a curve, right? Yeah, they have, you know, all of these concepts, and just, you don't know what the hell they are, and then you just put them out, I don't know. Okay, so you have things like work and, and so on. So a, a lot of these things are based on what they, the intuitive idea of what velocity is, let's say at a curve without self-intersection, uh, if this is parameterized by gamma, uh, and the usual uh, flat geometry of the plane, then the velocity of the curve in, the, in this usual Newtonian setting uh, of gamma, uh, say at t, uh, is defined to be gamma, the derivative of gamma, is the derivative of gamma t, which we quite often write is if we have this thing going into the plane, so if we do have coordinates uh, x and y, say, in the plane, uh, it would be x dot y dot. That's the velocity, and it and is a velocity vector gamma. gamma. Yeah. And already.
already you see what I'm, I'm repeating what I said this morning, that this is a vector at a Fußpunkt. This is the one German word you also learn. I don't, I don't know the good use of other than English. Foot point? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know it in English. I know it only in German. Fußpunkt. So it's a vector at a Fußpunkt. And this Fußpunkt is moving. That means at each point there is a vector space where this tangent space lives. Where this velocity lives. At each point there is a vector space where the velocity lives. The vector space is moving. That's what I tried to emphasize this morning. Yes, you have two velocity vectors at two different points. They are in two different vector spaces because the Fußpunkt is different. So that's the situation velocity. And somebody along the line had a very good idea to define the notion of a tangent vector. Because tangent vector, not just to a curve, not just to this curve, just tangent vector, say tangent vectors at uh, a base point, say at the base point, x0. Uh, what is that? Well, let's call it v. And you know, this is, now we're starting to do mathematics. If I ask my five-year-old grandchildren, a child, what is a tangent vector, he'll draw some picture of a tangent vector. He would even draw, the, he, he's not stupid, he would even draw something like that, or like that, or to his figure or something. But that is only some optical thing. Yeah. A tangent vector, you must define it some way. Okay. I will define it in two ways. And you pay your money and take your choice which way you like it. My, my friends in mathematics say, uh, mathematics is capitalistic, you just pay your money and take your choice. So we give two definitions and you pay your money and take your choice. As long as you pay me, that's okay, I just take the money. I don't need the money, so I don't want it. So anyway, it's not just some arrow. Okay, definition one. You know about this, but I'm repeating it to warm you up today. Definition one is, is that is the tangent vector v, I'm not going to write it out, is the tangent is the, in the tangent space at, at a base point x in this manifold, is an equivalence class of curve. First-order development, second-order development. What the physicists do, they look at first-order development, then they throw away the rest, rest and say, we're finished. Oh, insulting physicists. It's not true. They might look at second-order development. <laughs> okay. So you define gamma 1 as, gamma, as equivalent to gamma 2 at the point, uh, I don't know, x0. If and only if gamma 1 uh, uh, has a, and gamma 2 have the same affine part. So that's first order, first order part. Okay? Right, that means they're tangent. So two curves are equivalent if they're tangent. Right? So that means this, this curve and this curve are the same because if you look here, they are tangent. I don't know what order they are tangent to. They could be tangent to order one, order two, order three. That's a deep discussion that is sometimes confusing, but tangent to order one is no problem. It just means they have the first, same first order stuff.
that means uh, that means that the gamma one is equal to an affine map a one plus little o uh, one, and gamma gamma two is equal to an affine map uh, plus little o one, and and the first order terms are the same affine map one affine equals affine map two. This can be defined in coordinates. So. That's a very intuitive definition, I think. Better definition. Maybe it's not so intuitive. You know about this and you've thought about this. Is you define the notion of derivation. So for definition two, this is maybe definition one. Uh, so we need the notion of a derivation. And the word derivation, you certainly see the similarity to the word derivative. And this is what I have in mind. So derivation of what? A derivation of uh, a proof Nice, if you can prove a new theorem, that's nice. I don't mean that. It means derivation defined on some algebraic object where you can add and multiply. Yes. I call certain things like, like you can multiply two things in this algebraic object. Uh, for example, you take a function and multiply by another function, that's still a function. You take a function and another function, you add the two functions, still a function. Those two things, those two operations, my, I call addition and multiplication. You have addition, uh, you have scalar multiplication, a f plus b g. Right. right? In that case, uh, this object you're dealing with is called an algebra. Right. So we talk about derivations on an algebra. Algebra, in our case, of functions, something where you can multiply the two, like functions. Right. Okay. I refuse to write the definition on the book. Part of my lectures always are to tell you, this is a concept, it's very important, it means this, it's your job to sit down and write the definition. Yes. That means we have a thing called A or R, depending on when it's called an algebra or a ring. Say an algebra over the real numbers. Right? There's a vector space over the real numbers. Right? That means you can multiply things in there by, by the real numbers and add and so on. And you can multiply objects in this, in this algebra or ring. Okay? And of course, I, I am interested in commutative situations, so I assume that f times g is equal to g times f. This is not always the case. I know many examples where it's not the case. Very many examples, and you do too. For example, algebras of matrices. Right? A times B is not necessarily B times A. Yes. Right. And that's important. But at least I'm talking about a derivation of commutative algebra. So it's, this is, uh, 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 maybe I call that delta, from an algebra to another commutative algebra, say over the real numbers. So that this thing here, is uh, R linear, and, and a derivation, and so D of F G equals D of F G plus F D G. Okay. If you were a dark German chauvinist, you will call this Leibniz rule. <laughs> it is Leibniz rule it is written down abstractly, right? Notice very, notice, this is Leibniz rule written down abstractly. But in physics, I will scream at you, Poisson algebra. The action of a function in quantum mechanics on a state is called bracket F comma point bracket. 
you know in Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay, that is a derivation. Okay. So this appears everywhere, a derivation of something like this. This is the property. It is our linear and Leibniz rule is satisfied. I have here allowed it to, uh, to maybe not be commutative. Derivation of f times g plus f times the derivation of g. Usually you don't write it that way with derivatives, right? You write f prime, you write, you write. But what you usually write with derivatives is not what I've written here, right? What you usually write with derivatives is, let's say, ddt of at t equals zero, for example, of f g is f times, uh, no, yeah, uh, f prime at zero times g of zero plus uh, f of zero times g prime of zero, right? That's what you usually write in Mickey Mouse mathematics, you know, when you're looking at cartoons and Mickey Mouse and Pluto are going like that. Yeah. That's what you do in high school. And that is not what I mean by derivation here. This is an, a, time, a type of derivation, but look where the values of this derivation, what are the values of this derivation? Numbers. The values of this derivation are number. The derivative at a point. The value of this derivation here is it is a mapping from an algebra where multiplication is available and vector space coverage is available. It is a mapping from the algebra to the algebra. So it means the derivation of f times g is derivation of f times g, blah, 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 blah. And these, everything inside here are in the algebra, not numbers. These are not derivatives in terms of numbers. You get it? So in that sense, it is a, the derivative of a function is, I mean here, a function. Okay. Okay. So, fine. So we can talk about derivations instead, instead of derivations, I can talk about derivations with values in the numbers. And let's, let's call this star, and that is such a thing as this. Star would be something like this. Okay. The definition two of the tangent space. The tangent space at x zero is the set of derivations uh, from, let's say here, uh, C infinity of u to the real numbers, I'm going to write it out long, such that it's R linear, well, derivation in this sense, such that the derivation of uh, f times g is f at x0 times the derivation of g plus derivation of f times g at x0. So here I'm talking about derivations of number. And this, maybe I call the tangent space at x0, and the little theorem here is these definitions favorite lemma in this subject. So I will tell you my favorite lemma. I love this lemma. I call it the fundamental lemma. So it's useful. I call it the fundamental lemma. Asked 
uh, my good friend Piedmont, if he talked about any of his reason for it, the answer is yes, but I'll remind you of this. Uh, I don't know what he called it. Um, let's say, let's let F be smooth uh, on uh, a cube about uh, zero in R in R N. So something that is reasonably it's not complicated topological on the cube. And let's uh, let's assume that uh, f of zero is zero. So this is a trivial assumption. It means I can make some translation and then I can assume it's zero. And then this says that it says very simply that f is equal to x1 f1 plus plus fxn fn, where fi are also c infinity on the q. You know that or not? That is a wicked division theorem. Isn't it? If something vanishes, you believe you can divide it. In one dimension, if something vanishes at, at, at x, you want to divide it by x. All right? We just had a complex analysis course. You know that you have the, it's one complex variable, so you only have the z, right? So if something vanishes in complex analysis of order k, you can divide it by z to the k, right? Well, it means you can do here too, because you can apply that lemma again to f1, f2, and so on, and you go on and on and on, and of course what you're getting here is the Taylor series of the function, right? But the key theorem that I, I love to emphasize is the fundamental level. It is a division theorem for C infinity functions, right? It's very interesting. So I love this fundamental level. And once you have this fundamental level, you can prove that these two definitions are the same. Because that gives you, it's very easy if you have this form to compute what all the derivations are. Yeah. So you can do that. Yes, sir. Um, so what is the algebra? In this case, it, so in, in our case, yeah, in our case is the C infinity function. So yeah, on you. On you. Yeah, but then delta is also, C, but it, I mean, delta is a function from C infinity to you to C infinity from you. I said there are two kinds of derivations, and I, 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 I wanted to emphasize there are two kinds of derivations in my head. Yeah. The good kind, which you're referring to, and you're correctly, remarking on are maps from the algebra to the algebra. Yeah. So a value of a derivation is a function. But of course then you can evaluate that derivation at the point. Yeah. Yeah. And so you get a derivation from uh, uh, the algebra to a, uh, to a number. Yeah. So I'm saying there are two kinds. One with values in the numbers and one with the values in the functions. Then I wrote here carefully the tangent space is the kind with values in the numbers. That's what I mean. I'm talking about here, I'm talking about the values of the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So you would have delta of fg evaluated at x0, right? Delta of f what? g evaluated at x0. In, in that case, evaluated at x0. Maybe I wrote it wrong. But, well, in this case, at 0. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> okay? And I hope you see that here, this implies that. The tangent space at this, at, at, let's say, call it zero of this manifold, uh, is, is the span, in the sense of the basis, of the operators d1 through dn. I'm introducing here the notation of standard Riemannian notation. Physics people know this very well. di means ddxi, ddxi. And I mean here, evaluated again, these operators, it's, it's, it's his remark again, these operators I mean evaluated at, at zero. Okay. So evaluated at zero. Okay. So, okay. so there are two definitions. One is intuitive and very good for, for beginning. And it, it curves up to equivalents that are really tangent. That means tangent vectors. And, and another definition, which is equivalent, is 
this definition in terms of derivation. So as a little remark, which I think is slightly non-trivial, is this little uh, equivalence theorem uh, that it implies that the space of derivations or the tangent space at the point of M is an n-dimensional vector space. because I wrote down a basis. Okay. And now I'd like to use the word. So let's say this thing, I'm going to write some terrible thing here. I don't know whether this is a good thing to write or not. Let me write it like that. never write this again, but just to make sure you know what I'm talking about, is it's what he was talking about exactly about this thing. That's the, the, the operator ddxi evaluated at x equals a. Okay? I mean, it's terrible notation. I apologize. But, right? So you may have the operator with values of a function, or you may evaluate. Right? So I may write some evaluation here. Or maybe it might be good just to write ddxi at, at me. I'm not sure whether this is a good notation or not, but we'll think about it. <clears throat> and now my remarks from this morning. And tangent space at x0 and the tangent space at x1 and the tangent space at some other x, uh, a, and the tangent space at b, and so on, all these points are all different vector spaces. sit down and think about what the heck is going on here with operators that look the same, but they're not related because their values are in different spaces. And you in physics know this very well, because if you're moving in some physical setting, the relevant spaces move as you move. Right? The relevant spaces are not the same spaces. You even talk about moving frames, and this is based here and there. It's a different, different thing. These spaces are not the same. Nevertheless, we write them as a bundle. So the first big boy or big girl word here, which you've heard before, is the statement that what is relevant in any geometric situation is a, somebody asked me, what is geometry? It's a study of fiber bundles. By the way, this all comes originally from physics, and, and we just formalize this in mathematics. So these things are 
in a, in a, in a, in a certain bundle. I hope every, we have many foreign languages here for me in English, but do you understand what it, in German it's easy, it's the same word, bundle. But the Romanian, what is it in Romanian? You, you don't even know. And then we come to return for some. Bun, bundle. Mm -hmm. What it is in Nepalese, do you know? Some complicated word. Look, let, let me ask you this. When you, the farmers go in the field in the fall and they cut wheat and they put it in a, they tie it and they carry it here. That whole thing is a call, in English we say a bundle of wheat, maybe. But you can visualize it when I say this example is wheat carrying around a, uh, in the fall a bundle of wheat. It's called a bundle. So anybody can write the picture of a bundle. Let me write the picture that I just explained to my Nepalese friend because he's never seen a farm in his life. He probably comes from a big city. <laughs> You've seen a farm? Yeah. Oh, you lived on a farm once? Yeah. You had a girlfriend on a farm. There, right? <laughs> 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 but I was talking about with our Nepalese friend here, Sandeep. Yes, you see this bundle? Looks like that, right? Uh, that's what a bundle looks like. And there's even a, a way you tie it here, remember? That's what the farmers usually do because uh, otherwise it just flies apart. And each fiber of this thing, let's say if we have a point here, X, this fiber over X, we are organizing these things as fibers in what we call a fiber bundle. The fiber over X, maybe we write it and the fiber over X. This is the fiber over X. Okay. So upstairs is a differentiable manifold. Downstairs is a differentiable manifold. From upstairs to downstairs is a map. I mean, come on, this is really analysis minus 25. <laughs> right? You have an upstairs space and a downstairs space and a map. This map is surjective. That means through every point downstairs you have a fiber. You know, this farmer is carrying his wheat and downstairs he's parameterizing his wheat, wheat elements and you have the fiber over here. And this is the, we have all of these fibers. When we, and all of these fibers are smooth. This is a maximal rank map. This means if this is k-dimensional, then the rank k of this map is everywhere k. And so the fibers are everywhere smooth. Fibers everywhere smooth. Okay, and I call this projection mapping. And we call the fiber over x, fx, and the fiber over y, fy, and so on. Now, if you're lucky, if you're really lucky, I mean really lucky, every fiber is really simple-minded. Well, simple, I'll give you the simple-minded thing. Here is the manifold M. Here is the point X. Here is the tangent space to X. Here's the point Y. Here's the, tan here's the fiber over Y. It's the tangent space at Y. This bundle is a bundle of tangent spaces. We organize this like the farmer in Nepal, in the mountains, looking at some beautiful mountain walking there, having cut his grass, and he's the tangent space over X. He says, well, I'll put it here in this fiber, and I'll put the I'll organize it that way. Right? And we organize it in a way, and we can do this, if the variation is smooth. So in that you believe, going from one tangent space to another, it's easy to see that this should be smooth variation. So upstairs should be uh, a, smooth a smooth manifold. Downstairs should be a smooth manifold. You have the map from a tangent vector. Quite often we take a tangent vector here in x. I will write it as vx just to emphasize that it's a tangent space, it's a vector at this point x, and it comes down, and then it gets mapped by the mapping pi to x. 
<clears throat> so this is a bundle in the farmer. By the way, I drew the picture here with your farmer in, in this thing, this way, because there's a canonical section of this thing that everybody knows. It's the zero section. In every tangent space, you have a, a, a zero, right? <laughs> That's obvious. And so that, 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 that really exists like that. So you have a zero section in this thing. And I know you can easily read and think about this. And I know Kayvon talked about this. Um, this is the first example of a C infinity vector bundle. The reason it's called a vector bundle is every fiber is a vector space. And adding the vector space structure is smooth and so on. And then, we talked about, also Kevin talked about it, I know in his course, he told me. He talked about a tangent vector, I talked about it here, uh, tangent, what a tangent vector is and so on. Okay, here's a tangent vector, here's the fiber over x, let's say, I'll make that here blue. And here would be a tangent vector over x. And then somebody had the good idea of saying what a vector field is. A vector field is just a field of tangents that moves smoothly. Is that not what a vector field is? It's a smooth variation of tangents. I mean, you have it here it is, it's moving smoothly here. Isn't that true? At each point, it is tangent.